very good evening to you. Welcome to The Learning Zone, educational programmes through the night on BBC Two. This is the shape of the Learning Zone tonight. In a moment, the Open University. And then at two, it's night school. BBC Focus is at four. And to finish off, more from the Open University at six. Chemistry makes it all happen for the Open University tonight. In half an hour, take a look at two examples of organic chemistry at work. Its role in chasing away aphids and controlling heart disease. After that, an exploration of the chemistry behind three synthetic materials which have revolutionised everyday life, man-made macromolecules at 1.30. But to begin, stand by for blast-off and take a look at the chemistry of rocket propulsion. Ten, nine, eight... This is a sample of dinitrogen tetroxide, a compound which reacts very vigorously with many organic compounds. And today we're going to react it with aniline. We must pour the N2O4 rather carefully because it boils at a, a low temperature and we don't wish too much of it to vaporize as it is rather toxic. Now we can add the aniline. Again, rather carefully, because this is a fairly energetic reaction. And it usually proceeds even more vigorously once the tube has become warm. And you will see that this particular reaction is very reminiscent of a rocket fuel flame, which indeed it is. However, in the rocket engines which are used at present, aniline is not uh, used as the fuel. Instead, unsymmetrical dimethyl hydrazine was used as the fuel in Apollo spacecraft, along with N2O4 as the oxidizer. And we can now demonstrate the burning of that particular fuel combination. It's necessary for us, first of all, therefore, to load the fuel tank. The hydrazine is the fuel. And here we have 30 millilitres of the fuel, which we'll now put into this tank. And you can rest assured that the actual loading procedure used by the Apollo technicians is rather more sophisticated than the one which I'm using here. However, there we have the fuel component now loaded and we must now proceed to load the oxidant the N204 it has been necessary to pre-cool the tank here because the N204 is very volatile and as you as you will see it will create a fairly large amount of fuming It is also a rather toxic compound, which it is inadvisable to breathe. Now we have both tanks loaded and are ready to fire. Like 
Norman Logan's splendid model, a real rocket is also powered by chemical energy. And the source of this energy is the propellant. It usually comes in two parts. A fuel, like the petrol you put in your car, and an oxidizer, like the oxygen it burns in. To fire the rocket, these two components are brought together. And they react in a controlled explosion. But how are the components of a good propellant system chosen? Well, one criterion is pretty obvious. The reaction between them should obviously release as much energy as possible. It should be highly exothermic. There are other criteria, and we'll come back to them later. But let's start with this one. What makes a reaction exothermic? Where does the energy come from? To answer these questions, we need to look more closely at what happens on the molecular level when substances react together. The reactions you've seen so far are a bit complicated, so let's start with a simpler one. It's a combination that's been investigated by NASA as a possible rocket propellant, the reaction between hydrogen